It is no secret that the NFL draft is coming up, and now with free agency pretty much done with, I chose to dive deep into some of the prospects in this class. What are their strengths? What do they offer to some teams as opposed to what player B offers to other teams, right? And I also look deep into these teams and their tendencies when scouting players, when drafting players, how they choose to approach their team, what are their weaknesses. There's a lot of things that go into making the perfect mock draft. And the fact is, no mock draft is going to be perfect. But I use the information that I have access to to try and predict the NFL draft. Keep in mind, these aren't picks based off of what I would do. These are picks based off of what I expect to happen. So I hope you enjoy. Please leave a like if you do enjoy. Maybe even subscribe for more content like this. And I'll see you all at the end. Now, starting this up, we have... What feels very obvious, I would be very surprised if there's a curveball here. It seems like an 100%er, an 100%er that Caleb Williams ends up being a Chicago Bear with the 101 first overall pick of the 2024 NFL Draft. It feels inevitable, okay? All we've seen has been proving this, right? We saw... In the pro day, just the other day, Caleb Williams' pro day, Keenan Allen was there right after they added him. It feels extremely obvious. What do I think of this pick? Even though I'm not huge on Caleb Williams like everyone else, the upside is definitely there, okay? This guy can become a Hall of Famer off the physical talent alone, all right? I have questions about his ability and structure, but the ability as a backyard ball playmaker is obviously there. Obviously. So Caleb Williams as the 101 feels inevitable. It's an 100%er at this point. I'd be very surprised if we got a curveball there. Next up, we have Jaden Daniels going to Washington. This feels like the consensus right now. There are some people that are leaning a little bit more towards Drake May. But all the rumors that have came out are saying Jaden Daniels is their guy. Jaden Daniels is their guy. It's also very important to remember that they brought in Marcus Mariota to be their new backup quarterback. Unless they don't draft a quarterback here, which would be the ultimate curveball, right? But they are 99% chance drafting a quarterback. And bringing Marcus Mariota tells you the type of quarterback they're looking for. Because you don't bring in a quarterback, even if it's a backup, you don't bring in a quarterback that doesn't really match your scheme, okay? Marcus Mariota can do a lot as a scrambler with his legs. And Drake May could do that too, but Jaden Daniels is more of a running threat than Drake May is, okay? If they were looking for like a balance, I don't think they would have went with a Marcus Mariota to be their backup quarterback. So Jaden Daniels to me seems like the guy. A lot of the rumors are saying Jaden Daniels is their guy. I would be very surprised if they go with Drake May. Very surprised. I'm a fan of Jaden Daniels and what he provides in the modern NFL, okay? I think he is built for the type of offenses that teams are running nowadays. Not a Shanahanian offense, but if you're running like a spread offense, like Washington is going to be running with Cliff Kingsbury calling plays, I do really like the scheme fit. So Jaden Daniels, to me, I I feel like he's a Washington commander. I feel very strongly about that. Now, we have a trade at the 103. The Patriots are going to trade away the third overall pick to the Minnesota Vikings in exchange for the 11th overall pick, the 23rd overall pick, and the 108. Now, from the Patriots' perspective, they're a team with so many holes, they need to get more capital. All right. The Vikings have two first rounders. At the 11th overall pick, you could get a very talented player. And then the 23rd overall pick, you could also get a very talented guy. And maybe they even trade back further later on to get even more draft capital because the Patriots really do have that many weaknesses. Now, on the Vikings side of things, I mean, they're a team that just lost their quarterback, okay? And not everyone likes Drake May, it seems, but I think the Vikings are one of the teams that do like him. Maybe they even like McCarthy more 
But the point is, you're not getting McCarthy or Drake May at the 11th overall pick. It's just not happening. With all the rumors that came out about how teams see these quarterbacks, you would be very lucky to get either of those two in a pick with a pick that is not inside the top 10. So the Vikings I have trading up in order to get their guy. Who is their guy? Is it J.J. McCarthy? Is it Drake May? I have it Drake May. Drake May. I'm not sure who heard about the connections between the Vikings and Drake May, but a lot of their coaches, or a couple of their coaches, some significant people in their coaching staff, have worked with Drake May in the past. So that's a part of this. And I also just think the physical profile, it's there. It's very clearly there. This guy provides a lot of the talent that you'd really like to see in a quarterback that isn't just in that Kirk Cousins tier, isn't just like mediocre. No. They moved on from Kirk Cousins to bring in someone that could truly elevate the offense. Okay. Truly elevate the offense. And also get that quarterback on a cheaper deal, obviously. But they want someone that could elevate them. And I don't think McCarthy can do that extremely well. I think he definitely has the ability to do it. I mean, his arm is amazing. There's no doubts about that. But Drake May has all those traits that make an elite quarterback in this league. Now, he also has a lot of qualities that make you say, like, this guy can't succeed in the league, absolutely. But despite the room for improvement, he has the traits that a team like the Vikings is looking for when they're moving on from Kirk Cousins. Because they moved on from to bring in a game-changing quarterback because Kirk Cousins wasn't that. Drake May has the ability to be that. So he's the third overall pick here. Next up, we have Marvin Harrison to the Cardinals. They are so weak at receiver, and Marvin Harrison, I still think, is the solidified wide receiver one. I know some teams seem to apparently think Malik Neighbors is the wide receiver one. I personally just don't agree. I like Neighbors a lot, but Marvin Harrison, what he provides in terms of route running, he has the size, he has the speed. I mean, he has it all. He really has it all. He's such a complete prospect. I I love him. I love him. He's the best receiver prospect I've ever watched. Yeah, I, I mean, there's just so little that he can't do. I mean, maybe you have some gripes about his lack of physicality as a receiver, but still getting him with the fourth pick, I, I love that value. I think he is a tremendous player. I think he's going to be one of the best receivers in the NFL from the get-go because he is that complete, he is that pro-ready. And let's be honest, the Cardinals receiver core is not a strong room. They need that true threatening blue chip wide receiver, Marvin Harrison can be that. So he's the fourth overall pick for me. I feel very, very comfortable with this. But the other guy that a lot of teams have as the wide receiver one, reportedly, Malik Neighbors, he goes right after him. Malik Neighbors has game-changing speed. He has route running ability. He could just separate really, really well. He's a big play threat. He's a huge big play threat. And the Chargers offense under Harbaugh is going to be a lot more run the ball, smash mouth football. But they're still going to want to be able to hit that big play action shot every now and then. And Malik Neighbors allows them to do that. Okay, Having someone like Neighbors that can make big plays as often as he can with Justin Herbert throwing him the ball, I mean, that's threatening. That is threatening. The only thing that's going to restrict that is, again, this team is going to be a lot more run heavy because that is Harbaugh's ideology. That is... Greg Roman's ideology. But when they are passing the ball and they're utilizing play action, Malik Neighbors and Justin Herbert, they are going to do damage. All right. This is a connection I really like. After losing Keenan Allen, they need to bring in someone like this. They also lost Mike Williams. I mean, they need receivers. Malik Neighbors at five. I love it. I don't have him as the wide receiver one, but I still think he's a great, extremely high caliber wide receiver. Next up, we have JJ McCarthy, fourth quarterback off the board right here. Sixth overall pick, New York Giants. I think it would be smarter for them to go with a receiver, even though Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison are off the board. But if you like McCarthy, you have an opportunity to keep him on the bench if you feel like that's necessary. All right. But if he does look really good in the preseason, then you could throw him out there as the starter over Daniel Jones. But the good thing is they have that option. You know, that's always good. It's always great for a team when they don't have to throw a quarterback into the fire. And because they have Daniel Jones on the roster, that is a good thing. Now, of course, New York media is going to be a huge problem when you have two quarterbacks. I mean, 
in New York, that's never a good thing. <laughs> that's never a good thing. But there is definitely positives there. Like I said, McCarthy does provide you with some athletic ability. And we know that Brian Dable likes to have that. He also provides you with some amazing, amazing ability to just fire the ball in there. Something, again, we know Dable likes. All right, He likes the strong arm kids. And McCarthy has the arm that you're looking for. He has the mobility that you're looking for. I'm not a huge McCarthy guy, okay? I think a lot of it is in the eye of the beholder. But all these reports are making it sound a lot like the Giants love him, okay? So because of that, even though it could be a smokescreen, everything could be a smokescreen, right? But because of that, because of these reports that the Giants taking a quarterback is the worst-kept secret in the NFL Combine, I, I gotta go with McCarthy landing on the New York Giants. I, I really do, and, you know, I believe it. I really, I believe it. Now, the seventh pick. I mean, getting Joe Alt here, with him being the surefire prospect that he is, as the seventh pick, this is a franchise tackle. This is a franchise tackle, and it feels like almost a guarantee. All right, I do have some questions about his anchor, but besides that, he d he does everything. He does everything. Last year, the Titans drafted a prospect, I would say, was very similar to Joe Alt because of how technically refined he was, Peter Skaronsky. But... Joe Alt doesn't have the gripes about his size, okay? He doesn't have this, oh, yeah, you know, he has all the technicality and he knows how to work his arms and legs together. He knows all the technical stuff, but he doesn't have this overwhelming strength and the size isn't there. Joe Alt has all that, along with that refined technique that you look for in an offensive tackle in this league. Sir Fire Prospect. Sir Fire Prospect. That's what Joe Alt is. The Titans need that, okay? They tried to gamble a little bit with Andre Dillard last year. It didn't work out. Now they're moving on to Joe Alt, or at least that's what I have them doing. And I think that's a great fit. So, that's what we're doing here. Next up, we have the Falcons taking Dallas Turner with the 8th overall pick. Perfect scheme fit in Jimmy Lake's 3-4 defense. Because he played in a 3-4 defense in Alabama. And the thing that impresses me so much with Dallas Turner is his coverage ability, right? I mean, people will talk all they want about how he's a physical specimen and he's built to be a pass rusher, and he is. But for someone that could pass rush like he can, it's difficult to also have such a refined spot drop coverage skill set. Yeah, he does. Okay. So Dallas Turner provides a lot to your team if you're trying to disguise stuff try and make teams think that you're gonna get pressure from this spot and then you have someone dropping back turner can do that turner can do that well i'm excited to see what he can do in a falcons defense that should fit his skill set well so dallas turner eighth overall pick i feel very comfortable with that one jared verse going to the chicago bears now the bears are interesting because you would think a team that has the number one overall pick would be way more incomplete they would have a lot more holes but you look at that roster you kind of struggle to say oh yeah they need this they need this they need this however i do think getting someone complimentary to montez sweat would be very nice for them i really like what jared verse provides i think that combine really showed teams hey this guy seems safe on tape but then he also has all this physical upside Let's bring him in. I think that the Bears look for these type of defensive ends that can defend the run first and then make plays as a pass rusher second. Jared Verse fits that bill. And he can make plays as a pass rusher. Absolutely. But more than anything, he's a run defender. And I am really impressed by that aspect of this game. He is the perfect Eberflus defensive end. Again, we just talked about scheme fits with that last pick. This guy is even more of a scheme fit because Eberflus loves guys like Verse that defend the run from the edge spot. Verse does that, and then he also brings stuff to the team as a run, as a pass defender along with his skill set as a run defender. So I really do like Jared Verse, what he is going to provide to this Bears defense. I would love to see them go with him with the ninth overall pick. Now, number 10, you could debate Brock Bowers here. I absolutely get it. But, and I don't know if this is the Jets' thought process. It is very hard to get a grasp. 
But we do have to keep in mind, Joe Douglas does really like to go with his tackles, okay? He builds through the trenches, which makes sense. And even though they just brought in Morgan Moses and Tyron Smith, both of those guys are older. They could get banged up. Olu Fashanu gives you the ability to still protect Rodgers and make sure Rodgers doesn't get injured if someone like Tyron Smith, who has an injury history, goes down once again. It's not a huge shot because Olu Fashanu can at least pass protect at an NFL level. I like him as a run blocker, but you know for a fact you're getting a great pass blocker. Now, as a run blocker, there is still a little bit of work to be done, but I, I still think he's capable. All right, Fashanu, I really like as kind of safety precaution for the Jets. I know what you're thinking. Oh, 10th overall pick, why would you spend that as a safety precaution? Because the fact is, you look at this roster, they're not weak at any of like, the crucial spots. And yeah, you know, they could get better at certain spots. They absolutely could, right? Like a, a wide receiver three would be really nice. I, I don't doubt that. But to me, it's more important, especially for this Jets team that had their quarterback go down last year, it's more important for them to bring in the safety measure at tackle than to bring in the absolute weapon at tight end. It, to me, it's that way. To me, it absolutely is. And again, Joe Douglas, he likes to build through the trenches. That is his top priority. Worst case scenario, Fashanu switches to guard, or maybe he just stays on the bench all year. Worst case scenario, and then you bring him out next year. And then he ends up being phenomenal because Tyron Smith is on a one-year deal. I really like the idea of the Jets bringing in Olu Fashanu if he falls this far. Now, the New England Patriots... They're a team that needs all the help they can get offensively. They really have nothing to work with on the offensive side of the ball. And yeah, they could take a quarterback in theory, but I really think they're comfortable with Brissett as their bridge guy. And I think they want to build the structure around the quarterback first. Oh, Dunze is a great receiver, getting him at 11 overall. That's huge. That's huge. They need receiver help, without a doubt. And Odunze can provide that to them. Odunze has a very complete skill set that definitely should be able to translate to the NFL. He should be one of the more capable young WR1s in the NFL. And this is a team that hasn't had their WR1 in a very long time. So now I think it's time for them to take someone who, to me, seems pretty damn safe. So I'm a big fan of Odunze if he potentially goes to New England. I think he would be great no matter where he goes, but New England is a team that could provide him with the volume he wants and he will provide them with the skill set that they need. Just a safe target for Jacoby Brissett and their young quarterback that they may bring in down the line. Number 12. We have the Broncos going with Bo Nix. Sean Payton needs a new quarterback. There's no doubt about it. And they need someone that could just execute the offense. That's what he wants. He wants someone that could just play the position of quarterback the way he wants. And Bo Nix can do that. Bo Nix absolutely can. Absolutely can. Nix impresses me in some ways that don't really show off on film, which is kind of frustrating because Oregon didn't use his full skill set, and I don't think Denver will. But... Oregon proved, despite the fact he has the talent to make plays when necessary, you're more often going to see him just execute in structure, execute the way the play was drawn up, and that's exactly what Sean Payton wants. Bo Nix, to me, is a perfect fit for the Broncos and what they're looking for offensively. Now, the 13th pick, we have Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU going to the Las Vegas Raiders. You look at that receiver core right now. They have Devontae Adams who could really separate. You know, he, he separates with finesse. He's very technically sound. He understands the ins and outs of route running. Then you have Jacoby Myers who is very similar, a little bit faster, and does a little bit more with twitch than Devontae Adams. And then you bring in Brian Thomas to be that true 50-50 ball receiver. Kind of that Z guy who could just... Go out there. You need a 50-50 ball. 
he'll catch it. Oh, you're against the top secondary in the league and no one can get separation? You're no longer separation dependent. Throw it his way, there's at least a chance he catches it. Okay? Thomas provides that to a Raiders team that I think really wants that. Really wants that. And yeah, they could take a quarterback here. They absolutely could. If they want to go Penix here, that wouldn't be awful. I, I mean, I wouldn't love the value, but I would understand the thought process. But they do have Gardner Minshew. They do have Gardner Minshew. So there's not really the rush to take the quarterback, especially when someone like Brian Thomas is available, who, again, I think just fills out the rest of that offense very well. Because defensively, I am really excited to see what they're going to do. Offensively, I have some questions. I do think Thomas answers a lot of those questions. 14th pick, we have Brock Bowers. The Saints need a spark. They do, and Brock Bowers is just the best player available right here. They have a capable tight end, but Bowers' skill set, it's one of one. You don't see this often. I think getting him at 14 is an absolute steal. And like I said, they need a spark. They need something to make them go from mediocre to actually competitive because right now they're paying players like they're competitive. And I do think Bowers is someone that could potentially just carry you to relevance. I do think he is that caliber of player at not really an impact position, but it becomes an impact position if you use it like an impact position. I think Bowers can be this next big, next great tight end. I would take him over Kyle Pitts, personally, as a prospect. I know it's easy to say that in hindsight, but this is the best prospect as a tight end I've ever seen. I think getting him at 14 is an insane value pick. And the Saints have guys at every spot, so it's not like they need to take a very valuable position. And again, you bring in Bowers, you're not using him like you use other tight ends. He's getting wide receiver one volume because he's just that caliber of a player. He is just that caliber of a player. So I really like Brock Bowers. I would love to see the Saints go with him. Now the Colts taking Quinion Mitchell. First cornerback off the board right here. And one, I, I do think it is a scheme fit. I do think it is a scheme fit. Gus Bradley, he likes his zone coverage corners. He does. And Quinion Mitchell did that a lot at Toledo. I think that that was where he excelled the most. Another reason that I have them going with Quinion Mitchell is because Quinion Mitchell had a 9.75 RAS score. And I know that sounds like just some advanced analytic that there's no reason to really care about to some people. And some teams do see it that way. The Colts aren't one of those teams, though. You look at everyone they drafted last year, they were all performing very well in that RAS score metric. And RAS score, by the way, is relative athletic score. It's basically they measure how much you weigh, and what you probably should be running if you're a normal human being, and compare that to what you actually ended up running, and what your vert was, and what you did on the bench press. And Quinton Mitchell balled out at the combine. The Colts bring in athletes, okay? That is what it's been in the Shane Steichen era so far, and I don't think that's going to discontinue now. I don't. So Quinton Mitchell not only is a scheme fit, he also checks all the boxes that the Colts look for in a player. Insane athlete. I really think he's going to be their guy at corner. Now the 16th pick, I actually have center Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon. This guy's skill set, it's rare. It's rare. I know I'm going to set the expectations really high for this guy by saying this, but I find it really funny how we lose Jason Kelsey. He's out of the NFL the same offseason where this guy comes in. Not saying he's going to be this first ballot Hall of Famer like Jason Kelsey. But... The skill set is very similar. It is very similar. He just gets out in space and does a really good job in the second level and he'll drive guys down the field. Very impressive guy. Very impressive in terms of athleticism, in terms of, again, his ability to get out in space and make blocks. Insanely impressive. I really like Jackson Powers and his ability to do that. The Seahawks are kind of an offense that lack an identity in my mind but I do think bringing Jackson Powers Johnson kind of creates clarity at least to what your run game is going to be you bring him in you are going to run a lot of inside zone you're going to run a lot of outside zone you are going to prioritize getting your linemen out in space and like I said Jackson Powers Johnson does that at an insane 
level. Insane level. And it's very rare that you have an interior offensive lineman that really sets the identity of your offense, but I do think Jackson Powers Johnson is one of those guys that are that caliber. Okay? I love him. I love what he provides. And the Seahawks are a team that were very weak on the interior offensive line. Jackson Powers Johnson will allow them to change that. Now, with the 17th pick, I have Terry on Arnold. Okay? This is someone who could play man, can play zone. He does it all. And I really like his skill set. Really like his skill set. He can lock guys up one play, and then the next play he can play the role of a ball hawk. He's really, really well-rounded, really technically refined. Overall, just very impressive player. Very impressive player. I really like him. The Jaguars are rebuilding that secondary. Okay, they released a lot of guys. And now, like I said, they're going to have to completely rebuild it from the ground up. No better way to do that than draft my second corner. Okay, and no, I'm not having these guys get drafted in the order that I like them. I'm having them get drafted where I think they belong. Terry on Arnold, at least right now, where I currently stand, he's my second best corner in the draft. My first best is not Quinnian Mitchell, by the way. I love his skill set, and he's very schematically versatile because he played a little bit of everything in Alabama. Was very impressive with all of it, and he has the physical ability to be great in this league. I'm super impressed by Terry on Arnold and what he provides. I think that the Jaguars would love to bring him in. The Bengals I find really interesting because they brought in a huge offensive tackle in Orlando Brown last year. And then they also brought in another huge offensive tackle in Trent Brown this year. And the thing about Talese Buega is that he can play tackle if, say, those guys aren't overly good. But if you need to bump him into the interior, he could do that and be amazing. Amazing at it. And he checks those boxes. If the Bengals are looking for big guys that can really drive people down the field with overwhelming strength, Fuega does that. And he does it well. From Oregon State to Cincinnati, I love Fuega as a schematic fit for the Bengals. I love him in terms of the type of player they're looking for. Clearly on the offensive line, they want big guys. They want guys with a lot of mass that drive people down the field. Fuega checks those boxes. Whether he's a guard or a tackle, that's the question. But he's definitely a Cincinnati Bengal in my mind. Next up, I have the Rams taking Laiatu Latu from UCLA. He's an interesting prospect because he is really technically refined. I don't think he holds his ground overly well against the run. But... I mean, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't impressed by just how technically sound this guy is. The Rams are a team that, yeah, they have some young edge rushers on that team, but I'm really looking for a guy, okay? A guy to be alongside Kobe Turner on that defensive line and really push them into the next generation of Rams defense without Aaron Donald because that's something you have to keep in mind. Aaron Donald being gone means they're going to have to bring someone in that can consistently get pressure on the quarterback. Kobe Turner I did really like, but now let's bring someone in on the edge to really help him because now Kobe Turner is going to get a lot more double teams, a lot more. They need to bring in an edge rusher that could really help him out there. They do. And again, they have some young guys that I like, but Latu could really elevate that defense and make it so the loss of Aaron Donald doesn't hurt too much. Now, next up, we have a trade. The Steelers have the 20th overall pick, but I have them trading away to the Buccaneers. Let me just clarify right now. I'm not just throwing random numbers out there. I used a draft pick value chart to make sure the trades make sense and, you know, it's equal value. And this one, although I had to do a lot of work here, <laughs> it could happen. It could definitely happen. It is in the realm of possibility. Hence why I have it occurring. The Buccaneers, overall, I just think that they're a team that wants to move up here to draft this next guy. A lot of corners went off the board recently. I think they want to get their next cornerback. And I think the 20th overall pick allows them to do that and get their guy. The Steelers are a team, I think, want a receiver. Without a doubt, they want a receiver. And I... I don't think they need the 20th overall pick in order to do that. So why not trade back? And for the Buccaneers, why not trade up? 
okay? Yeah, the Buccaneers, they have some other weaknesses you want to try and patch up, but I don't have them giving away too much value in order to move up those six spots. So they could still fill some of the other holes. And the Steelers, why not trade back? Because like I said, you you would be kind of reaching if you take a receiver here. So if they really want their guy, and you're going to see who their guy is, they could trade back. And the Buccaneers I have as a team that is willing to trade up. So that's what I have going on here. And the Buccaneers, I think that they like Nate Wiggins. I really do. I think Nate Wiggins is a Todd Bowles type of cornerback. I know that sounds strange because you think, oh, he's so undersized. You know, Todd Bowles, he doesn't want that type of guy. I disagree. I think if you look at this group of Buccaneers cornerbacks, guys like Jamel Dean, they're not big. They are not big. They are thinner guys that are really athletic and really good in man coverage. Nate Wiggins fits that bill to a T. Okay, this guy isn't going to be playing slot corner. All right, he's not going to be missing tackles that are overly crucial. He's going to be outside. And he's going to be locking up whoever he's man-to-man with. Locking up. Because he is a true, like, shut-down cornerback in man-to-man coverage. He is undersized. I'm not doubting that. But the athleticism more than makes up for it. So Nate Wiggins, not only do I think he's a Todd Bowles cornerback, I also think he's a very high-caliber corner who is worth the 20th overall pick. But the cornerback run continues as a player that I love goes to... The Miami Dolphins. Listen, man, the Dolphins are a team that, yeah, they have Jalen Ramsey, but with Xavier and Howard out of there, they need someone new. They do. And the Dolphins' defensive coordinator is Anthony Weaver, who comes from the Ravens' Mike McDonald type of scheme. What does Mike McDonald love to do? He loves to disguise coverages, and he likes to have some guys blitz when he thinks they're going to drop back. Cooper DeGene can do all that stuff. He is the most versatile defender in the entire draft, and every Mike McDonald disciple needs their Kyle Hamilton. I absolutely think Cooper DeGene can be that guy for them. The skill set is one of one, insane athlete. I absolutely, absolutely love him, and like I said, he fills a need for them. He is definitely a scheme fit. I would be very surprised if he's on the board at 21 and the Dolphins don't take him. In fact, I think they might even trade up to make sure that they get him. The fact he fell to 21, I think, is kind of a miracle. But that's just how the board ended up playing out. I really like Cooper DeGene, and I would love to see him on the Miami Dolphins. And the quarterback run finishes off here. A fifth cornerback in the first round, Kool-Aid McKinstry, goes to the Philadelphia Eagles. This is a team that really likes to build on the line of scrimmage. However, there's no doubt that they need some new corners on that team. There's no doubt about it. Kool-Aid McKinstry is here. He's very pro-ready. I would be really surprised if the Eagles do not take him and he's on the board. Listen, if they take another lineman, which I guess is in the realm of possibility just because of how Roseman works. That would be a huge mistake. That would be a huge mistake because they need some fresh blood in that secondary. McKinstry, like I said, is very pro-ready. He could run a little bit of everything. I would love to see him land on the Philadelphia Eagles. He really checks the boxes for Philadelphia. Now, the Patriots use their second pick in the first round that they also acquired from the Minnesota Vikings. On J.C. Latham, offensive tackle from Alabama. Some people think he could play interior offensive line, but let's be honest, they need this guy playing tackle. His strength is one of one. He's someone that could really drive people down the field. He has remarkable anchor. He reminds me a lot of like a Trent Brown, and that's someone we've seen the Patriots bring in. Okay, so the strength alone allows him to be a round one pick. I think the Patriots need someone who has kind of that high floor. And some people that I've talked to see him as a high floor prospect. Other people see him as a lower floor prospect. But the point is, this guy's strength is one of one. And I think the Patriots are attracted to that. I think they need new 
offensive tackles, and J.C. Latham can play that role for them. So I have the Alabama prospect going to the New England Patriots to help rebuild that offense. Then with the 24th pick, this guy fell way too far. Amarius Mims going to Georgia. Let me tell you right now, him landing with this team that could just develop offensive linemen this well, come on. It, it, it's only going to end well. The Cowboys are going to absolutely, absolutely pop off the screen as they go from Zach Martin and Tyron Smith to now Tyler Smith and Amarius Mims. I mean, talk about no drop-off whatsoever. I really think the Cowboys are just going to have another decade of having the best offensive line in football if they develop this guy properly. If he lands here, first off, yikes for the rest of the league, but second off, they're going to develop him to be a really, really good player. The big concern with him that allowed him to fall so far in my mind, and I could absolutely see him going much higher because he is an insane athlete that fills all those traits that teams seem to be looking for. Uh, But he only played eight games, so that's a huge, huge concern. But... I mean, the film speaks for itself. He is a remarkable prospect. You have some concerns about injuries, but the Cowboys, I don't think they'd hesitate with the 24th overall pick to take him. Next up, we have the Green Bay Packers taking Troy Fotanu. And this is an offensive lineman who, once again, very technically sound. Can play tackle, could play guard, really play... He plays offensive line, all right? He can really move people with his footwork. Again, technically sound guy. He can zone block. I really like him as a zone blocker more than anything. You need someone there now that you lost Runyon, now that you lost Bakatari. And this is someone, because of his versatility, can really just go anywhere on the offensive line and play well. Like I said, he has a high floor because of his technique. I think the Packers, if they want to compete, they need to bring in more linemen. After losing some guys during the offseason, this guy from Washington can absolutely play that role. And now the Steelers take their receiver. Xavier Leggett from South Carolina. They're going to be looking for someone that could help out Justin Fields, that could help out Russell Wilson. They want to throw the ball deep. They're not going to go from read to read to read. That's not how they operate. They just lock on to a guy and then throw it to them. Leggett is that type of receiver that you're looking for then, man. He absolutely is. This guy is going to catch 50-50 balls. And he's going to separate with speed alone. And, you know, he's a underrated route runner. Leggett, man, I, I really like his skill set. And I think a team like the Steelers with those quarterbacks... You want to bring in a receiver like him that could kind of play that role. He isn't going to operate in, or he could operate in like a normal offense, but you're going to maximize him by playing in this simplistic one-read type of offense. You are. And him and Pickens as two outside receivers, that's that's ridiculous, man. I, I really think in terms of physical freaks of nature, there's not a more freaky offense at the receiver position than those two together. There's not a more freaky duo of receivers than those two together. So I really likely get, I think the Steelers, they'd love to bring in someone like him. Then the 27th pick, I have Byron Murphy from Texas. This is someone that he doesn't hold his ground, but man, can he shed blocks. Man, can he just fire into running lanes and just make tackles? The Cardinals... Head coach, Jonathan Gannon, he has experience with some high-caliber defensive linemen. Some guys that got taken early because they're freaks of nature. Okay, they're amazing athletes. And Murphy, I think, is going to be that next guy. He is He is such a, such a great athlete. They need interior defensive linemen. Like I said, Gannon has operated with high-caliber interior defensive linemen before, and it worked very well. I'd love to see it again would help the secondary out, and especially, especially it would help that run defense out. So I I, fit, I think that's a great fit. Then we have the Bills taking Adonai Mitchell. 
Now, I wasn't really planning on having them take a receiver. I really wasn't. But I was looking at their roster, and I was like, man, you know, Stefan Diggs, he's not quite that high-caliber receiver anymore. Kincaid's been good, but he hasn't been this game-changer. They need someone out there that could just allow Josh Allen to single-handedly win them games, even when the defense isn't playing great. And there was a part of me that wanted to go corner, but the corners are gone, right? And there's a part of me that wanted to take interior defensive lineman, but I think stylistically, yeah, they could take Jerzon Newton, but he's the same as Ed Oliver, okay? What they need on the interior defensive line, they need gap fillers. And I don't think there's someone that you would take with the 20th overall pick to be a gap filler in this draft class. I, I really don't. A.D. Mitchell can make Stefan Diggs' decline feel so minuscule, so minuscule. And yes, they brought in... Curtis Samuel. Okay, I get it. That gives some people some optimism. Sure. However, A.D. Mitchell can be your bona fide one. I love what he provides. I am in love with A.D. Mitchell as a route runner. Reliable hands. Can catch a 50-50 ball. He's too big to run like he does. Okay. He doesn't provide too much after the catch, but that's really the only weakness. Like I said, great route runner. Reliable hands. Insane body control. He just hauls everything in. Love him as a wideout. I think the Buffalo Bills would... I mean, they'd love to bring in someone like him. Really compliment Josh Allen. But now we have a trade right here. I have the Raiders moving back up to the 29th overall pick. As they also receive a third rounder because they're giving away next year's second rounder. Along with their second rounder this year. I think the Lions don't feel an overwhelming need to stick at this position. I, I don't I don't see anyone on the board where they're like, oh yeah, we absolutely need to take him. And then the Raiders, I mean, it'll make a lot of sense when I show you what they're going to do. But I think they have a plan right here relating to a certain very valuable position. The Lions just see an opportunity right here. They're not planning on trading this pick away, really. But the Raiders, I think they're going to call them up and be like, yeah, man, here's an offer. You can't refuse it. You don't need that pick. And the Lions are going to say, like, yeah, man, we we feel comfortable moving back. We don't feel overwhelmingly positive about anyone that's here right now that we wouldn't be able to get at the 44th pick, so fine, let's do it. And I think the Raiders are going to do that in order to bring in their quarterback of the future, Michael Penix. I do. And listen, some people aren't very positive on Michael Penix. I'm not going to act like I love the guy. I'm not, but there has been some talk, there has been some rumors about the Raiders looking for an older quarterback that they could take in the draft, and Michael Penix is an older guy, he is, and again, I, I don't love him going round one, but the thing with taking him round one is that you get that fifth year option, you do, and I think that's big, I think that is very big, especially at the quarterback position, especially at the quarterback position, because they get paid so much after their rookie deal is up. So, they're going to trade up into round one just so they can take a quarterback and have that fifth-year option. They see panics dropping down the board, and they're like, man, I want this guy, and I want him for five years, and I want to try and develop him. Behind Gardner Minshew, let's do it. Okay, two second-rounders, go right ahead. We'll do it. All right, I, I think the Raiders are very attracted to Michael Penix as a prospect, and... I think him falling at 29, I would be surprised if they're not trying to ring up everyone's phone in order to try and move up. 30th, though, and this is just a perfect, perfect fit. The Ravens, they like these huge, huge prospect at offensive tackle. And they like big offensive linemen overall. And the fact is, Kingsley Suamataia, see, I could pronounce it, don't, don't doubt me, uh, I think that he is exactly what they look for in an offensive lineman. Six foot six, three hundred twenty-five pounds. He kills people in the run game; just kills them. He's an insane athlete, and he can play offensive tackle, interior offensive line at a high level. And like I said, it's just exactly what they're looking for. They lost some guys on the offensive line; they need to replace them. And using this thirtieth overall pick in order to do that. I would have no gripes with it. 
So then we have the 49ers with the 31st overall pick, taking Jordan Morgan, offensive tackle, interior offensive lineman, very versatile guy. That offensive line last year, besides Trent Williams, was very weak in my mind. And I think Jordan Morgan can really help them fix that. <laughs> okay. Listen, man. They have weapons. There's no doubts about it. But you got to be able to win on the line of scrimmage. And I don't think the 49ers were great at doing that besides Trent Williams. Jordan Morgan can do that. And he could do it well. And I really, really think this is a reliable guy that could play multiple different spots on the offensive line and really fix their woes on the line of scrimmage. But the last pick, we have the Kansas City Chiefs taking Keon Coleman, freak athlete, wide receiver. They need wide receivers, without a doubt. And I think Patrick Mahomes would love to have someone like him on his team. Such a great athlete. This is someone that will make up for someone like Kelsey maybe having another down year. But he could also not be overly great, okay? There is a high ceiling, low floor with Keon Coleman, but I think the Chiefs are willing to take that gamble. And that is all for this video. I hope you all enjoyed. If you want more content like this, feel free to subscribe, even leave a like if you enjoyed the video. I highly appreciate you giving it a watch, a listen, whatever, whether you were doing your homework with it in the background or even watching and looking at the graphics that took significantly more time than they probably should have. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.